I am joined today by Nina Teicholz, a New York Times best-selling investigative science journalist who has played a pivotal role in challenging the conventional wisdom on dietary fat. Her groundbreaking work, The Big Fat Surprise, which The Economist named as the number one science book of 2014, has led to a profound rethinking on whether we've been wrong to think that fat, including saturated fat, causes disease. In op-eds, interviews, and articles, Tayshuls continues to explore the political, institutional, and industry forces that prevent better thinking on issues related to nutrition and science. Published in the New York Times, The New Yorker, The British Medical Journal, Gourmet, The Los Angeles Times, and many other outlets. Nina, thanks so much for taking the time out today. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, listen, before we dive into the whole saturated fat story and the history of why you know, virtually all the medical advice we're getting from governments and institutions tell us to eat a low-fat, low-saturated fat diet, can we start with uh, you telling the listeners a little bit about how you got started down this road uh, in the first place? Yes. Well, um, I uh, am an investigative journalist. I was doing a series of articles for a magazine on um, on the food industry and was assigned to write a story about trans fats and um, kind of blew that. This was in the early 2000s. I sort of blew that story wide open. And um, in researching that story, um, I realized there was this incredible, even bigger story about all fats, how we had seemingly got it wrong about, you know, good fat, bad fat, non-fat, low fat, which is, of course, what all of our dietary recommendations have obsessed about most. Um, And, you know, just a couple of clues that told me there was this huge story. Scientists were literally terrified to talk to me about fat. I mean, they would, I got hung up on, or somebody would say, you know, if you're going to talk about fat, and I, I can't even talk to you. Um, There was so much fear in the field, and I heard stories about industry, margarine industry executives visiting um, the offices of scientists and saying, like, I don't know, I don't know how you, (laughs) you, that cat got out of the bag with your research. I mean, crazy stories, and it was so different than what I had expected from the field of science, right? Sort of calm, reasonable people discussing alternative hypotheses. I mean, here was... (laughs) Like evidence space. Here are these stories of just of bullying and manipulation and, and industry influence, and um, you know, it just completely fascinated me. And it, and and I slowly began to realize there was just a huge story here. How we had gotten really fifty years of our dietary policy completely wrong. Um, you know, I should also say that when I started, I was a vegetarian. I was a vegetarian for. Um, nearly two decades, and I, I mean, a near vegetarian. I didn't eat any red meat, no, um, no butter, no cream, you know, very few eggs. Or anything. So I really, um, I really started off in a completely opposite place from where I ended up. Um, and so, you know, it was really a, a 180 journey for me. Definitely. I mean, and this is uh, actually for myself as well. And, you know, in your book, which is a, a phenomenal treatment of this whole topic, The Big Fat Surprise, a New York Times bestseller, you know, you, you kick things off by talking about some of the ancestral populations and the and the doctors and researchers like Vilmer Stefansson and Dr. George Mann, who, who were, you know, investigating, you know, the Inuits living in the Arctic or, or tribes in, in Africa. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, the history there and, and, and how it relates to, you know, meat consumption, saturated fat? Yeah, well... So for my book, I spent almost a decade reading every single nutrition science study that I could get my hands on. And um, one of the things that became clear to me is that there was a large, large body of scientific literature that had been just ignored or actively suppressed. Um, Because from the 1950s on, there was this dominant hypothesis that saturated fat and cholesterol caused heart disease. And so any evidence to the contrary was, um, you know, had to be, it was inconvenient, so inconvenient that it had to be ignored. Like it wasn't included in review papers and it, it just never got to be part of the accepted literature, what I call silent studies. So I went back and, and I, and I tell the story of a number of these so-called silent studies in my book. There's a story of, um, the, um, one of the famous ones is George Mann, who is a biochemist at the University of Vanderbilt, who goes off and studies the Maasai warriors in um, Uganda and Kenya and takes electrocardiograms on 600 of them and discovers not a trace of or, or maybe one possible heart attack um, and finds that their diet consists of 
meat and blood and uh, fat <laughs> and milk. And that's it. They're not eating any fruits and vegetables. They're, you know, they have a 100% failing grade by any diet that we think is healthy, and yet they have no traces of heart disease. Their cholesterol stays is very low, and importantly, does not rise with age. Also, very low blood blood pressure that does not rise with age. So, um, another example is um, Wilhelm Urs Stefansson, who was a Harvard trained um, doctor and anthropologist who went off and lived with the Inuit in Canada and discovered that their diet was 70 or 80 percent fat um, from you know seal and caribou, and that they prized the fat. That was the part that they sought most. Um, and he was a doctor trained to diagnose people, so he could also see, you know, no traces of heart disease, no diabetes, no obesity. Um, so, and there's another example closer to home in Pennsylvania, Rosetto, Pennsylvania. Researchers followed a group of middle-aged men, Italian immigrants there, who ate um, a very high-fat diet. They described it as, you know, prosciutto with an inch rim of, of fat around the edge, and cooked everything in lard, and yet. For they followed them for five years and not one instance of any kind of cardiovascular event. Um, so these were all, uh, importantly, I need to say I'm not by these examples recommending that everybody run out and eat for a sure. 70 or 80% milk, meat, and blood diet. <laughs> but these are important. The reason that I recount these stories in my book are to show one, these are observations that contradict our dominant hypothesis, right? They're observations that our hypothesis can't explain. And in science, if you have observations that your hypothesis can't explain, you have to go back and question your hypothesis. Maybe we got it wrong about saturated fat and cholesterol. And also to tell the political story of science, you know, which is in, in all of this history, politics is so much more, um, explains so much better what goes on in nutrition than does the actual science itself. And the story of these papers being suppressed, ignored, um, that is part of the politics of the field that are important for people to understand so they can, they can, you know, it's hard to understand how, how did we get to where we are today? Wasn't there science to the contrary? And the answer is yes, there was, but it was ignored. And that's a question that just doesn't seem to be asked very much in uh, the traditional setting of just how did we get here today? Why is why are we recommending uh, lower fat diets sort of across the board? And you know, you'd mentioned Dr. Stefanson. He was he sort of took it to the nth degree, didn't he? he? Did a study there where it was just a solid year of nothing but meat, correct? Yes. After he came back from the um, from the Canadian Arctic, nobody believed him when he said that that they, these Eskimos lived on on you know fat and meat alone. And so he and a colleague. Um, subjected themselves to a year-long experiment, first in an inpatient hospital setting in New York City, and then they were um, they were just heavily supervised. For a whole year, they ate nothing but meat and fat. Um, had a team of people analyzing and examining them and testing every, every possible um, parameter, um, and they came out at the end being absolutely perfectly healthy. There were, there were six papers published on that experiment. And and you know none of those, of course, were cited or made it into the common, uh, commonly cited literature. And again, not, not that we're recommending a meat-only diet for a year, but yeah, this idea that if it goes completely against the current hypotheses, and this definitely has to be investigated. But of course, we don't see any any evidence of that. Now, can you can you walk us through how this got to the next level in terms of you know Ansel Keys's work and the diet heart hypotheses? Because I think even a lot of docs are unfamiliar with with how we've gotten here uh, to the situation today. Yeah, I mean, it's um, it's a really it's it's a story, you know. Like any idea has a moment in time when it was born. So the idea, you know, we've been living with it for so long, we we sort of forget. Actually, um, you know, our great grandparents had no fear of meat and fat and saturated fat. It that idea that we should fear those foods in order to prevent heart disease really started in the 1950s when. Um, there was a panic over the rising tide of heart disease. Heart disease had been quite rare in the early 1900s and had risen to be uh, an epidemic by uh, the 1930s and 40s. Certainly in the 50s, President Eisenhower 
himself had a heart attack and was out of the Oval Office for 10 days. So there's just a state of public panic on this issue. And there are a number of explanations that were proffered about what caused heart disease. Some people said it was um, auto exhaust, more cars on the street. Other people said it was vitamin deficiency. Um, but there was one hypothesis by Ansel Keys, who was a pathologist at the University of Minnesota, and he, his idea was that it was saturated fat and cholesterol in food that would raise the total cholesterol in your blood, clog your arteries, and give you a heart attack. That was called the diet heart hypothesis. Uh, and he, he was um, a very um, outsized individual. He was, uh, he was somebody who had an absolutely unshakable faith in his own beliefs. He, it was said, I was told by many people that he would argue anyone <laughs> to the ground. And he was called bullying even by his friends. Um, and so he was this outsized individual who was able to get onto the nutrition committee of the American Heart Association, which was really the only group advising on heart disease in the in the 50s and, and early 60s, so that in 1961, when Ansel Keys joins that committee, the American Heart Association issues the first ever advice anywhere in the world to cut back on saturated fat and dietary cholesterol in order to avoid a heart attack. Um, that's it. That's, that's where it all began, and that was the little acorn that grew into the giant oak tree of advice that we have today. That's where it started. And at the time, I mean, there were doctors and researchers who opposed this theory, right? There were quite a few critics of, of Ansel Keys at the time. There was a healthy debate on this issue um, that went up really through the mid-1980s. Um, and um, there were many attempts to prove this hypothesis. So when it came out in 1961 with the American Heart Association, there had really only been one large epidemiological study called the Seven Countries Study that had been conducted by Ansel Keys, and that seemed to show an association between uh, lower saturated fat consumption and reduction in heart disease rates. But you know that's only association, it can't show causation, and there were a number of really big problems with that study. Um, which I go into in a lot of detail in my book and are pretty fascinating. But I should say that, you know, then there were, you know, people understood that was only an observational study. We needed randomized controlled clinical trials, and those trials were done. They were done um, by governments around the world, really well controlled trials in inpatient settings like mental hospitals and, you know, the kind of study you can't do today because it's considered unethical. Um, altogether, those trials were on more than 60,000 people in experiments lasting one to 12 years. I mean, huge studies where they, um, half the people got what was considered standard back then, 18% of calories is saturated fat. Um, I know which sounds, sounds uh, crazy. Today's standards, right? Radical to our ears. <laughs> But that was the that was the control group. That was what was considered a normal American diet. And then um, usually the intervention groups. I mean, there was there's a variety of different study designs. But um, in the largest such trial, the intervention group had nine percent saturated fat, which is about what we're recommended to eat today. So they had instead of you know they had lean meat, soy filled cheese, soy filled, soy milk, um, and at the end of all those experiments, which have recently been reviewed, um, kind of unearthed and reviewed because they were ignored for a long time. They could not show, they could not prove Ansel Keys right. They could not show that reducing saturated fat had any benefit for cardiovascular mortality across the board. Um, and there was this deeply uncomfortable side effect, which is that the groups that had consumed more vegetable, polyunsaturated vegetable oils instead had consistently higher rates of cancer. They died at higher rates of cancer, which was um, something that the NIH reckoned with in a series of high-level conferences in the early 1980s and really could never resolve. I mean, it's incredible in terms of how we sort of gotten to this point, especially with the shifting over to the vegetable oils, which we'll definitely touch on here uh, in a minute. Can we can we circle back and, and just can you touch on the, you know, the Framingham study and how that's uh, obviously deep rooted when we see uh, lipid panels from from patients that's all relative to the, the the framingham study and the progressions of that study so can you can you give us a little bit of background there and, and really what the um, the conclusions were 
Yes. Um, the Framingham study was, uh, is, it's still ongoing um, today, is a, Framingham was a town outside of Boston where they did the largest ever epidemiological study to, to of a population. Um, I forget exactly when it was started, but, <clears throat> you know, maybe in the 50s uh, or 60s, but yep. it's a long-running study. And it basically tried to understand what were the risk factors for heart disease. Um, was it total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, smoking, um, diet? Um, and it's a, it was a government, you know, NIH-funded and run study, and it was, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a legendary study in the history of our understanding of heart disease. Um, one of the, and, and it, this is also an example where many important results were suppressed. And here I mean literally suppressed. So um, the leader who worked on the diet section of the report, he came out with a finding that saturated fats um, did not, or any kind of fat, did not provoke or promote heart disease in any way. That was, they could not find an association. Um, and that result was, um, he wasn't allowed to publish it. It was buried in a, um, in a basement somewhere. Jeez. And um, so he literally was not allowed to publish that study. In fact, I talked to, so that was George Mann, actually, the, the man who also went off to Africa to study the Maasai warriors. And I spoke to him before he died when he was in a nursing home. And he said, he told me about that episode, um, which was also confirmed by others who worked on the study. But he said that he was... And he was one of the vocal critics against Ansel Keys, um, and he said that he and his career was destroyed by being a critic, um, which is sort of another reality, another of the political realities of the field, is that the critics were harshly treated and sort of drummed out of the field. And he said, so one day, remember, he's the head of a whole division of the Framingham study. One day he's in the halls of the National Institutes of Health, and his secretary pulls him out into the corridor and says, um, you know, you, you must stop your opposition to Ansel Keys because it's going to cause you your research grant. Um, and shortly thereafter, he lost it. Incredible. So, but getting back to Framingham, I mean, what Framingham initially reported um, was that total cholesterol did seem to be correlated with heart disease. But then in the early 80s, they reversed that finding and said they could not find a correlation between total cholesterol and heart disease, which is something that has been... Um, confirmed in other observational studies. Total cholesterol is not a particularly meaningful predictor of heart disease. Um, and, um, and they could not see any benefit from lowering total cholesterol. So that the, all their, you know, um, that, it, that the people who lowered their cholesterol and the degree of lowering total cholesterol did not have an impact on cardiovascular mortality. Yeah, it's incredible. I mean, even today, we still, you know, when cholesterol levels, of course, here in Canada, above 5.3 total cholesterol, then we doc start thinking about putting them on medications. And, you know, effectively, what you're saying is the research just does not back that up. And we even see in the follow ups there on the Framingham, you know, for every 1% drop in cholesterol, you know, we're getting about an 11% increase in coronary and total mortality. So this is, uh, you know, we're, we're chasing the wrong, uh, we're chasing the wrong smoke here, aren't we? Right. Well, I mean, so that's like an actually an adverse outcome from lowering total cholesterol, um, and that was also found in the, in, a, in the largest ever test of Ansel Keys' study called the Minnesota Coronary Survey, where they followed um, four and a half thousand people for five years in mental hospitals in Minnesota. So, a well-controlled experiment. They found the, the greater the degree of cholesterol lowering, the, the the higher the chances of of causing a heart attack. It's just cause and effect. It's a randomized controlled clinical trial. And so, um, and then, you know, the whole debate shifted over to LDL and HDL, you know, and, they, and these sort of, those were kind of, those have been competing risk factors now. They, um, and they're all, they're, <laughs> and for a long time, um, cardiovascular authorities and officials have focused on lowering LDL cholesterol. That's still true today. But the Framingham study, um, actually found that HDL was a much better predictor of cardiovascular risk than LDL. Um, and in fact, in, in a number of diet studies, which um, different than, than drug studies, but in 
in a number of diet studies, the, the LDL lowering has, has no effect on, through LDL lowering through food, through a low fat diet, has no benefit for cardiovascular mortality. Yeah, it's so it's it's really eye opening. Um, you do amazing treatment of all this in your book, and of course, it dovetails into this question around vegetable oil consumption, which you know really should be called industrial seed oils. Which, as you mentioned in the book, you know before 1910, we really didn't. Uh, there was no consumption of these things, and of course, by you know the year 2000, it's about eight percent of all calories that we consume. Um, so, can you talk about that? This uh, shifting gears in terms of ramping up vegetable oil intake in the population and the impacts there on on health and. Yeah, I mean, so vegetable oils, polyunsaturated vegetable oils, um, like sunflower, um, safflower, today it's mostly soybean oil, but it started off as cottonseed oil. Um, crystallized cottonseed oil, is, the acronym for that was Crisco, which uh, you all know was, um, it's the very first vegetable oil product to really enter our market our, our food supply in a commercial way that was introduced by Procter and Gamble in 1911 actually they thought they would first market it as a soap um, but then they thought oh it looks just like lard so we'll market it as replacement lard and um, they had this very successful marketing campaign to get they, they sort of they, they likened it to you know women getting rid of the spinning wheel get rid of those um, old-fashioned and dirty lard products and 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 instead adopt this clean, machine-produced um, uh, Crisco. So, um, and that was very successful, but that was really the introdu re introduction of vegetable oils into our food supply. And then it was followed by, you know, vegetable oils in bottles. And, um, and these gradually grew up in the food supply, and the American Heart Association began telling people to replace their saturated fats with these polyunsaturated oils, right? Well, one of the things that I discovered in my research was that um, Procter & Gamble, maker of Crisco and, and other vegetable oil products, had actually launched, helped really launch the American Heart Association into the powerhouse that it became. Back in 1948, Procter & Gamble had, you know, the American Heart Association was this, like, sleepy little um, cardiologist association without any money <laughs> and then Procter and Gamble comes along and says we will designate we'll make you the designee of our, our famous it was called the the radio man walking contest and um, and according to the American Heart Association's own official history it says overnight millions of dollars flowed into our coffers and we opened chapters around the country and we became the powerhouse that we um, you know, that we were destined to become. It's still the number one largest um, not-for-profit organization in the country. Incredible. Launched by Procter & Gamble. And it still has many, you know, just a long, long list of um, food company sponsors. So after being launched by Procter & Gamble, they come out saying, well, you need to eat vegetable oils for health. Um, and um, there's actually the president of the American Heart Association um, appearing in advertisements for Procter and Gamble vegetable bottles of Procter and Gamble, um, so there was always this kind of cozy industry tie. Um, but there were also a number of scientists who genuinely believed that polyunsaturated vegetables, because they lowered cholesterol, were would be better for health. You know, there was Ansel Keys and his group who genuinely, I think, really believed that. Um, you know, I have to note like how ludicrous that was as an idea at the time because um, when when the American Heart Association started proposing replacing saturated fats with vegetable oils in 1961, actually animal fats had already been dropping in consumption. And what perfectly rose in lockstep with the rise in heart disease was the consumption of vegetable oils. If you look at that line, um, heart disease going up, vegetable oils going up, they're perfectly in parallel. Yeah, Which doesn't mean one causes the other. It just it doesn't mean that vegetable oils cause heart disease, but it's it makes it very unlikely that vegetable oils will protect you against heart disease. Absolutely, especially with everything we know today about obviously uh, going rancid very quickly, oxidizing, and as you mentioned before, you know, cancer rates, things like gallstones and inflammation all being heavily associated with increased intake and it's it's funny if, if people just had a bit more of a historical context i mean this stuff like you mentioned was originally designed to make soaps and candles and waxes and lubricants and fuels and now all of a sudden it's this thing in our diet that we're meant to to ramp up the intake 
Yeah. I mean, uh, yes, the, the, in the experiments that I, the trials that I mentioned, um, vegetable oils actually caused cancer and gallstones. Um, and they had, um, they've long had, as you said, and I write about this in my book, that they're, they're highly unstable. Poly, the poly means multiple double bonds in every molecule and every single one of those double bonds, especially when heated, but even at room temperature will, will, um, reach out to oxygen and, and oxidize. So they're highly, they create especially when heated, such as in restaurant fryers, they create hundreds of oxidation products, um, some of them known toxins like aldehydes, which are very toxic. And this gets into your, when you eat it, it gets into your body. And we um, we don't know that much about them. They haven't been studied. Um, but from all the research I could pull together, I found that aldehydes um, are extremely dangerous, that these vegetable oils cause, um, seem to cause massive inflammation in the body and that they cause um, oxidized LDL cholesterol, which you know is the kind that seems to lodge in the arterial walls and create the kinds of plaques that are unstable. Yeah, you, know, you mentioned in your book as well, like the uh, prevalence now of using these uh, corn oils and, and vegetable oils, industrial seed oils as the common fast food to deep frying uh, fats uh, versus having previously used all these fast food companies, restaurants, uh, beef tallow and lard and things like that previously, which is just, uh, you know, it's incredible when research sort of makes the problem go from bad to really worse, right? Yeah. I mean, I know it's really hard for most people to think of something like lard as or butter as healthy because we've all lived so long thinking exactly to the contrary. But one of the great benefits of those fats and why McDonald's would used to fry their french fries in tallow is that they're stable. Saturated means they don't have any double bonds to react with oxygen. They are, um, they don't oxidize. And so they're, they're stable and they're long lasting. And that's, um, and, and that's, those are good qualities in food. Um, they're also good for food production, but, but, um, you know, that's one of the unsung virtues of saturated fats. They're stable, long-lasting, solid. They don't oxidize. And um, another fact that I know most people won't believe, <laughs> but in, in, in very, very careful trials where they've isolated um, fatty acids, they find that saturated fatty acids um, reliably increase HDL. You know, if you have low HDL and you, you know, what are your options when you tell you, you go to your doctor and he says, well, you can drink more red wine or exercise more, but really the most effective way to raise your HDL is to increase your saturated fat consumption. And I mean, this gets back to the myth around just generally eating red meat and the fear, which you mentioned, and you, you know, such a great comments in the treatment in the book is just this, you know, red meat fear that is still prevalent across uh, all society. Clients come in all the time and you know, if they're eating a healthy diet, they'll always mention, well, I don't eat a lot of red meat along with that. Um, so can you, can you touch a bit more on um, some of the benefits of, of, of red meat consumption? And, you know, in your book, the, the LRC trial, there were cholesterol medications, which is, again, what a lot of clients are on to lower cholesterol, the, the lack of, um, you know, findings that we see in some of these mega um, trials. So, right. Well, the subject of, of, of meat, first of all, um, the reason that we've avoided meat along with dairy um, is it was always the it's saturated fat content. So, you know, because it contains saturated fat and cholesterol, we thought those foods were bad for us. Um, and, you know, it's important to note that like an average porterhouse steak, only a third of the fat in that steak is saturated. The rest is the kind of fat that you find um, in olive oil, <laughs> or in, or or is um, or is is uh, it's called oleic. Um, so, you know, all foods are a combination of fat, different kinds of fatty acids. It's very rare that you find just like pure saturated fats. But anyway, that's why that's why meat was originally condemned. Um, but the saturated fat hypothesis has been falling apart in the last five, six years. There's been a number of review papers that have gone back and looked at all the data and realized actually it never added up. Um, there's been there's been over a dozen meta-analyses and systematic reviews looking at all that data. And then my I think my book has contributed to that because it was really the first major systematic effort to 
um, to argue that saturated fats had been unfairly condemned and don't cause heart disease. So now, why are we afraid of meat if saturated fat isn't bad for health? Well, there's a whole sort of new host of reasons that we're supposed to be afraid of meat. Meat apparently causes cancer. Meat might cause diabetes. So and the important thing to understand there is that all of that data comes from these weak observational studies with very what's called the relative risk is supposed to show the the number that shows like the degree of association, super, super weak relative risks on all those studies. Um, so it's very unreliable data. Um, and also it's contradicted by more rigorous clinical trial data showing that in, in a couple large NIH funded studies when they reduce red meat, they didn't see any benefit. So like significantly reducing meat and no benefit for cancer, no benefit for heart disease. So I don't, I don't believe that there's any rigorous data um, to show that red meat is bad for health. And what is the data showing that it's good for health? Well, it's, an it's a complete protein, right? You know, you can try to get a complete protein by balancing your grains and legumes and all that, but that's not so easy. Meat is a, is a, has all the amino acids, the complete protein. You can eat 125 calories of meat or you can have um, 700 calories of quinoa, <laughs> or you can have 500 calories of nuts. I mean, it's a very calorie efficient way to get the protein that you need. It's also um, a uniquely good source of bioavailable heme iron. So, you know, you may try to get your iron through spinach, but you have to eat like half a room full and it's not as bioavailable. Absolutely. And, you know, and a number of other nutrients, important critical nutrients, folate, um, selenium. I mean, and these are, I mean, red meat is exceptionally nutritionally dense. Um, and Americans need those nutrients because we're actually, there's a, there, we're in, in shortfall or uh, in, in a number of nutrients at population, on a population-wide basis. So, you know, we need those nutrients and we need them from natural sources. Um, and red meat is far more nutrient dense, it turns out, than chicken. I didn't realize this. I was always a chicken eater. But I'm like, you, you're getting, it's nutritionally, just doesn't even compare to the nutritional density of red meat. That's definitely one of the side effects of all these recommendations, as you mentioned in your book, is just we've, we've ramped up the chicken intake. And of course, I see it all the time when clients coming in, lots of poultry in the diet, lack of red meat. Uh, we just sort of ramped up that side of things as a, as a side effect of telling everyone to reduce that saturated fat intake. Yeah, well, so here's a, a numbers for you. Since from 1970 to today, the increase we've increased our poultry intake by um, about 120 percent, and we've decreased our red meat consumption by um, about 30 percent. Um, and beef is down even more steeply. So during which time the obesity and diabetes epidemics have exploded and we haven't conquered heart disease and cancer rates are up. So how can, it's just, it's, it's, it doesn't it, add up. No sense. It doesn't add up. Yeah. And you, and you touched on, you know, red meat containing oleic acid, which is the dominant fat in olive oil, which all cardiologists love yet somehow they've, they've missed the fact that it's also in red meat. Now, can we, can we dovetail off that and talk about the Mediterranean diet and how that was, uh, you know, seemingly the diet that all the medical community loved in the, in the 90s and 2000s and is still a big part of uh, what's considered a healthy diet and perhaps some of the shortcomings there. Yeah, I don't know how much, how many more heretical statements I can make to your audience. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> no, you're, you're in good hands. You're in good hands. <laughs> well, I, there's a chapter in my book um, on the Mediterranean diet, which um, I study in tremendous detail. And it's, again, a really fantastic uh, story, like political story. It turns out the Mediterranean diet is the product of the European Olive Oil Council putting together a series of the best ever food conferences all over the sun-kissed Mediterranean, Italy, Greece, Tunisia, and inviting all these scientists, food writers, uh, underwritten by all the, the interested industries that would benefit from this regime. And into that, um, you know, beautiful, like lovely net fell um, a number of our most prominent scientists, including all about, you know, the a group from Harvard and Tufts and, um, and they came out in, uh, promoting and endorsing the Mediterranean diet, which was um, uh, in, and promoting olive oil. 
um, as part of that. Um, so in my research, I, could, I, I looked at all of the data on olive oil and came to the conclusion that although it's better for you than polyunsaturated vegetable oils because olive oil is monounsaturated, so it's less likely to oxidize, mono means only one double bond, it has no special heart-saving powers, olive oil. Um, it just, they just could never be found. They, they tried to get an FDA claim for them, um, and they put together all the science they could find and they could not, they just couldn't prove it. So, um, and otherwise, you know, it's, it's, a the Mediterranean diet is otherwise pretty much the same as our, um, USDA diet, high in fruits and vegetables, legumes, whole grains, um, nuts and seeds, fish, and, um, it's, um, so it's not a particularly unique diet. Um, one, there's been really only one random, uh, one good randomized controlled clinical trial on the Mediterranean diet, um, which was conducted long after they've been promoting the Mediterranean diet for health. I mean, it's been, Harvard came out with their version of it in the early nineties. Um, and a, a clinical trial wasn't even done on it until, um, just a few years ago, really. So, and that trial found out that the Mediterranean diet was, did better than the control diet um, in terms of cardiovascular outcomes. But here's the interesting fine print of the studies, and it always comes down to the fine print. Um, and that is their Mediterranean diet, the one that was tested is a, a big experiment done in Spain. It was a higher, a high, what we would call a high fat Mediterranean diet. It was over 40% calories as fat. And what was it compared to? It was compared to a low-fat diet. So what that experiment showed, and and I should say, the intervention group on the Mediterranean diet ate a lot more meat than did the control group. So what that study, you could interpret that study in many ways. You could say it's the Mediterranean diet that works, or you could say maybe it's just a higher-fat diet that works a little better because we know the low-fat diet has been rigorously tested and found to be virtually ineffective for fighting any kind of disease. Maybe just adding 10% more fat into your diet is a healthier diet. And it doesn't matter if it's Mediterranean or if it's Swedish or if it's Russian, but you know we won't know that until um, we have a series of fantastic, wonderful conferences in other countries and yeah. study their diets. You know, I always joke in my book like, you know, actually, the uh, you know maybe the Siberian diet <laughs> is healthy, but there's no scientists signing up to go for conferences with their families in Siberia. Exactly, exactly, and it's uh, I mean, you do such an incredible treatment of all the fine details in your book, and of course, like you mentioned, the Mediterranean diet is also really low in sugar. You mentioned that in your book, which is also what we saw in the Framingham early studies, which you know doesn't get as much airtime as well. And the, the comment that I, I loved as well in your book, the, in Spain, the meat consumption since the 1960s has been steadily increasing quite dramatically till today, and their, their cardiovascular disease risk has been plummeting. Um, so again, there's these factors around reducing sugar and fat being just such key keystones to this whole conversation. Um, and so, you know, where are we at today then in terms of some of the, the, the research um, on sort of a, a higher fat approach? I know Dr. Eric Westman and, of course, Finian Bullock's original research in the 1980s. Uh, can you tell listeners, uh, you know, where things stand today? Yes. I mean, I think the rough arc of history um, over the last 15 years has been that the low fat diet, which we've long, um, which has long been the official advice, has really now been rigorously tested, and all those those large NIH trials came out with null results. And so, the low fat diet is quietly being sort of ushered out of our official guidelines. So, actually, if you go and look at the top line um, recommendations at the American Heart Association or at the U.S. Dietary Guidelines, which are really the two sets of guidelines that drive all of our nutrition education in around the country they no longer say to restrict total fat. They did for decades, but that's gone. And that, even though they haven't announced it really publicly or issued a press release, but the reality is that the data just did not support it. So they've had to back off the low-fat diet. Um, and, um, and I think that you know the evidence has just become more and more strong that eventually they'll have to give up their their caps on saturated fat too because the evidence doesn't support those either. But the really interesting thing over the last decade or 15 years has been that there's been this enormous interest in 
you know, what you would loosely call the low carb diet, right? Lower carb, higher fat. That means anywhere from 40% carbs, which by the way is about what Americans were eating in 1965 um, when we would all have been technically on the low fat diet. Um, <laughs> so, you know, down to what we call it, it's called a ketogenic diet, which is very low in carbs, you know, maybe 10%, 15% cal- of calories is carbs. But there's a huge, there's just been a, a, an upsurge, a welling up of research on this subject, and there have now been um, more than 75 randomized controlled clinical trials, and altogether many thousands of people, um, including experiments that are two years long, three experiments two years long, which really show if there are any harmful side effects. And collectively, those experiments show, um, you know, at a very minimum, that low carb is safe, does not have harmful side effects and that it is highly effective for um, helping people to sustainably lose weight. Um, And just as an aside, that's because it's a diet that does not involve hunger because fat and protein are just naturally more satiating. So it's a sustainable diet compared to a calorie restricted diet where, you know, people just cannot starve forever and that's, and, and, and it also depresses their metabolism. So low carb, is um, more sustainable for people. Um, it also has been found to be the very best diet for controlling blood glucose for um, diabetics. And a recent study, the biggest study on diabetics, is is just come out with interim results. It's on 400 patients at the University of um, Illinois. Oh, sorry, Indiana, and they found that after just a few months of of having diabetics on a very low carbohydrate diet, they more than half of them got off all their medications. So it That's seems incredible. to be... How long do we have to wait until we can call it carbohydrate intolerance disease? Is that around the corner soon? Or? <laughs> Depends on your circle. <laughs> okay, okay. And for, for all the docs out there, I mean, this is not a new thing, right? I mean, William Banting back in 1863, doctors in the early 1900s, this was sort of just common knowledge, right? Just low-carb diet to help people who were overweight or um, you know, to, to, to lose weight and correct a lot of, of, of issues, correct? Yes. Yeah, so yeah, that he he was um, the ban- Banting was like the Robert Atkins of his day. He sold um, thousands and thousands of, of of pamphlets on what he called his Banting diet, which is which is a low carb diet. And then I think of like the low carb diet is sort of like a low grade virus that has existed uh, throughout the 20th century. It was like. It was always there, and some researcher would pick it up and 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 write a book or pass it on, and then somebody else would hear it and do an experiment and pass it on. But it could never, it never really uh, rose to prominence until Robert Atkins, who's most famously associated with it. But he um, he was um, he, even in his day, you know, even though he had his own personal success stories, he there were no clinical trials. So when people challenged him on it, he would say, you know, come look at my drawer full of medical records. But, you know, critics would rightly say, but you need to have controlled clinical trials. Well, now those trials exist. Um, and so that diet is on solid ground. And, and just for um, doctors out there who are worrying about, you know, sure, you may lose weight, but um, doesn't that increase your heart attack risk down the line? Low-carb diets are shown to um, increase HDL and lower triglycerides dramatically. So, um, and I think that there's um, many people who would say that those are are highly reliable risk factors for for cardiovascular risk. Low-carb diets can increase LDL, um, but it's usually a transient effect, um, and it's not permanent. Um, but that said, you know, there's such tremendous, there's an enormous individual variation on these diets, and there's there's a lot of variation in terms of response of people's um, their lipid responses, um, and so it's you know it's still an unfolding frontier really to really understand what is the range of individual individual reactions to it. But I want to say again here the political note, which is that. Um, this entire literature, body of literature I'm talking about, has yet to be recognized by any official body. So um, it's, it's again, um, I think an instance of sort of, um, I, I know it's a strong word, but like suppression of the literature. It's not recognized by the American Diabetes Association, not recognized by the American Heart Association, not recognized by the um, expert committee for the last set of U.S. dietary guidelines. In fact, Congress called in 
the head of USDA and the head of HHS for two hours of testimony saying, why have you ignored all this literature? Um, and, um, and actually use the words, you know, don't these people have some kind of carbohydrate intolerance? Yeah. <laughs> and this is more than half of our population now. So why are we recommending a high carb diet, a one size fits all high carb diet to all? Shouldn't we have a range of options so that, you know, for the two thirds of Americans are obese or overweight, should we be telling them to have 50 to 55 percent of their calories as carbohydrates, which is what we currently do? Yeah, it's inc it's incredible, and as you mentioned, these studies. I mean, in that in those groups, seeing increased improved HDL, lowering triglycerides, lowering CRP, and, and insulin levels, and improving endothelial function, it's really tremendous. And of course, as you just mentioned, on the political front, there, it's you know, science by its nature should be skeptical of of both sides, and so it's curious as to why the skepticism just seems to run one direction with this whole um, saturated fat, um, you know, question. Which, of course, you know, your book is a thorough, thorough treatment of this whole topic. Um, now, rounding things out, I mean, where where do you think we're going to go from here in terms of uh, pushing forward? Are we going to start to see some change in terms of policy? Uh, are things going to are we going to start to break through? Um, because as you mentioned, I mean, we've got one out of two people now in America pre diabetic diabetic. Um, things are just seemingly getting worse with all the interventions that we've done. So it seems like now would be a great time to start to take action. Well, you know there. Are are various levels of action. So, you know, some people can um, just change their own diets. Um, they can learn how to be healthcare providers who know how to, who know how, you know, what low carb is. And, and, and then, you know, at the larger level, yes, I think that policy change needs to happen because as I've come to understand, um, nutrition, Nutritional advice is so much of a, a top-down system whereby, you know, medical professional societies, they kind of download the dietary guidelines and then dispense those and then doctors feel like and nutritionists and dietitians all feel like that's their, they have to recommend what their professional societies recommend. So there is, um, you know, the fastest and most efficient way would be to change our dietary guidelines so they actually are evidence-based, right? Let's not ignore this huge body of literature on the low carb diet that's um that's doing a disservice to the public i know right now in canada they're they're reviewing the dietary guidelines and i gave an hour of testimony before the canadian senate um and i don't know what will be their outcome i know the canadian heart and stroke foundation is the first foundation of its kind that i know of in the world that uh last year dropped their um, percent limits on saturated fats. And Fantastic. I think... Fantastic. Thumbs up to Canada. Yeah, I know you guys are always ahead of us. We have other reasons for coming to Canada, actually, now. But, exactly. um, but um, they didn't drop their... You know, th their language hasn't shifted over. But I think that was a meaningful shift in those guidelines. Um, so... Yeah, I think, and you're starting to see now, there's actually been a movement by um, medical doctors to um, join together and um, develop petitions for change. Um, and there's actually one in Canada that for Canadian doctors, I can send you the link and your listeners can, can add their name to that petition if they want. And we're doing... Absolutely. Yeah. We're, we're doing a similar one in the U.S. Um, you know, the reality is like, we've been living with a set of myths about nutrition for 50 years. And so undoing them is going to be a Herculean task. Um, Absolutely. I mean, the, that ground up approach that you speak of, though, is really encouraging to see more people taking ownership of their own health and, and being able to get a phenomenal information, you know, as is found in your book and online and various blogs and, and articles and just sort of questioning this, um, the approach in a sense of people are struggling with chronic disease and um you know symptoms of chronic disease they have you know they have some ownership over that and then it's amazing and especially working in clinical practice how you know diet exercise lifestyle as we see in the research like 90 percent of all chronic diseases so um amazing amazing treatment of this whole topic um i want to respect your time here nina so the the last real burning question here that the audience has been waiting for what is tell us a bit about your morning routine are you a coffee drinker are you a tea drinker what does your morning look like um well, um, 
Uh, I have coffee, only coffee, and I am an intermittent faster, so I do not eat anything until um, after 12. And that is my fascinating morning routine. Terrific. Black coffee. Is that like an Americano, drip, French press? What do you like? <laughs> I like Americano. <laughs> Fantastic. We like to geek out about coffee here. Um, yeah. Terrific. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time today. Um, where can people pick up the book? Where can people stay in touch with your uh, research? Well, um, it's uh, my book should, is on Amazon and Barnes and Noble, and um, it may be available to bookstores. But those are the main places to buy it. And um, again, I think it's. Uh, I just want to say, it really is. There are many books out there on um, on nutrition, but the, my the difference is mine is mine is not a diet book, so don't go looking into it for recipes. It really just it's been called a nutrition thriller um, by the Economist. It really is like the amazing story of the politics, the influence of industry and, and personalities and players in this story. Um, and then I'm